Welcome. This is a special edition of Revelations from Heaven because my guest is not only a personal friend, but he is what I consider to be the foremost thought leader, somebody who has been in the space of near-death experiences and who also helped me to open up about my own experience. My guest today is John Burke. Welcome. Great to be here. Great to see you again. Great to see you again, John. And you wrote Imagine Heaven in 2015, yeah. all of this time. What's amazing about that book is it has remained a number one bestseller all of this time. Yeah. And books just don't do that. Yeah. I mean, it's just incredible. And somebody gave me, John, a copy of your book years ago before I went public with my own story. Yeah. And, uh, and my sister-in-law said, you've got to read this book. And so I read it and I thought, oh, others have this experience too. You didn't know anybody had... I had didn't, it? well, no, I didn't know anyone personally. Mm. I knew about near-death experiences. Yeah. But my, my first question to you, John, because this is, this is very special. We're here uh, in studio together. And uh, it took you that long to write your new book, which is Imagine God in Heaven. Yeah. So interesting title. We know Imagine that, the God of Heaven. Imagine, imagine the God of Heaven. The God of he and yeah. And that that is so interesting to me how it took you that long and what prompted you to author a new book. Well, I mean, you know, the truth is I quit writing after I wrote Imagine Heaven. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> I and mainly because 25 years ago, as you know, the Lord called me to be a pastor, to start a church really for skeptics like me. And um, that's what I've been doing for 25 years. And writing Imagine Heaven was, it was kind of a um, obedience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as you know, I have been studying these for 35 years s since my dad was dying of cancer. And um, back when I was an agnostic and I've always had a curiosity, you know, ever since that I've had mm -hmm. a curiosity. And, and so I've studied it thousands now of near death experiences. And when I wrote Imagine Heaven in 2015, I mean, part of it was I was trying to show what I had seen over the years, which is the commonalities of all these near death experiences align in an amazing way with the the theology of heaven and hell and what would be expected from what scripture says. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was trying to show is that this, this is biblical. What, what people are saying uh, about the life to come, but it's hard to, it's hard to lead a church and <laughs> write <laughs> and speak and do things like mm -hmm. this. And so I, afterwards I told the Lord, I, I, I said, well, I think I did what you wanted. And I'm just going to focus on being the pastor you want me to be, because that's what he clearly called me to. Mm -hmm. And uh, unless you tell me you want me to write, I don't need to be an author. And so I stopped. And then in COVID, I got, again, the only time I've had such clear communication from the Lord. And what's interesting is it's the way you guys describe it. It's like to your soul, thought to thought, feelings whole history in a word or two right and that's what i got when i went to plant gateway the the church we started in austin and this time uh he spoke through that through people in that church to me and they didn't know it but like 15 of them over the course of a year pretty much saying the same thing mm. that I've, I've i've brought the leadership here it's time to pass the baton i'm gonna I'm gonna start giving you these things to write about and you're gonna write and that's about all you're gonna have time to do. Wow. And so, again, I'm just, you know, I, I, honestly, I'm kind of like, really, Lord? Like, you know, cause it's kind of like leaving <laughs> That Earth. was hard, wasn't well, it? Well, it's kind of I mean, like starting over after 25 years and, and I'm walking away from, uh, you know, the church that we found. I'm not walking away, I'm still there, but, um, you know, but I passed the leadership of it. That uh, was to, a big. That is a big church in Austin, and you 
you did start that church. I've been there, and it's an amazing church. It's really breaking down walls as to how God relates to us, not yeah. necessarily. I, I loved the first time I walked into the church, said God not only loves you, he likes you. Yeah. And that's a different conception of, of God. Yeah, and we were trying to we were trying to create a place where skeptics, cynics like I was, uh -huh. you know, could come and ask their questions and struggle and 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 come to faith. And man, we we've seen 5,000 people come to faith over the last 25 years wow. and uh, 65 nations represented oh in our goodness. church in Austin. Wow, it's it's wild. That's yeah. incredible. So I love it, and and I'm you know I'm still there as the founding pastor, but I think the reason, well, I know, I think what the Lord was saying is, um, I am doing something for this time, and I think what He's doing is He is He's bringing these testimonies of people who clinically die and come back. Um, you know, which is a, like I like to say, that's a high bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some people say, I wish I had that experience. And I say, well, there's a caveat there, you know. <laughs> well, and you know, we were just talking about some of the things you still have to struggle through from mm -hmm. dying, right? right? And coming right. back. Yes. And I, I like to say, yeah, show me, you know, there, most of the people I interview have a tracheotomy scar, right? Uh -huh. So it's a high bar. It's yes. E like you guys often say, it's easy to die. It's hard coming back. It is. It is. You know? There's a lamentation, I think, that, that occurs. But I do think what God is doing is he's raising up these stories all over the world, testimonies of people. And that's why I wrote Imagine the God of Heaven, that there are people all over the world from every continent. I've got people from every continent who, when they die, they encounter the same God. Mm. And it's not necessarily the God they would have expected culturally or even religiously. And yet this is the God of light and love, not a force. This is a very personal person, mm -hmm. knows them intimately, mm -hmm. gives them a life review. Some of them, though they weren't expecting Jesus, know or find out he's the, he's the God Jesus revealed. And this is happening everywhere. I have people from... Tehran, uh, who wow. told me their story in Farsi, and it was translated uh, from India, from Australia, Hong Kong, um, China, mm. atheist, communist Chinese, and yet they're seeing the same and experiencing the same God. So I believe this is God's apologetic for our new age. I've, I think in a globally connected world, he's saying, look, I have always been the God of all nations. You know, that's one of the things I, um, I'm trying to write about here is showing that what the scriptures have revealed throughout history, if you read the scriptures front to back, it's a love story. Hmm. It's God's like great that. love story. It starts off Genesis where he creates us for a relationship, to walk with him, mm -hmm. right? And then relationship rejected, Genesis mm -hmm. 3. And you know, God created us to be able to love God and each other, but that means we also have to be free even to reject the one who loves us. Yes. But he made a plan from the very beginning. So Genesis chapter 12, he raises up Abraham and Sarah and he says, I'm gonna make you into a nation. I'm gonna bless you so that all nations on earth will be blessed. And that's the story of scripture. There's, there's no other sacred religious writing where God is talking to all the nations like 500 times throughout the scriptures. He's doing what he's doing for all nations. Of course, Jesus came and died for the sake of all people and all mm -hmm. nations. And the Great Commission is go to all the nations, right? Yes. Uh, this message will, uh, of forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed to all the nations. And then the end in Revelation Chapter seven, a great multitude no one could count from every tribe, tongue, you know, every tribe, language, and nation and people group gathered around the throne of God worshiping him. Mm. And there's a great wedding mm -hmm. where God and his people are joined. And, and so if you don't see this big meta narrative of the Bible, you miss it. 
Yes. It's easy to miss. And I love how you uh, titled The God of Heaven because there's a different perception of God in heaven than there is perception oftentimes or probably in all cases on earth, isn't there? Because the revelation of God in heaven is full. Yeah. It's to completion. Whereas how we perceive God now is there's limitations to how we conceptualize him, preconceptions, yeah. how we're raised, how we, you know, think of God, oh, yeah. is he angry at me? You know, and a lot of people think God is angry at me. They and do. what you what you're relating is that we need to go, it seems to me, and I love the book, is that you are bringing people to heaven where you get to meet the real God. Well, the way, the way I like to think about it is we all, we're finite, mm -hmm. right? So we all have God in a, in a box, in our finite minds, all of us, me included. Mm -hmm. And I believe that one of the things that God is doing through these near-death experiences all over the world is he's helping us expand our box. Mm. God is, you know, it's, it's hard talking to you about this because I'm like, who am I talking to you about? <laughs> right? no, you it's... know more than I do. But, but on the other hand, I've interviewed so many people saying the same things. God is, his power, his glory, his holiness, his purity, his sovereignty, all these, all these big words like, like uh, this, this one nurse, Suzanne, who had this, she was 12, uh, when she had her near-death experience and she experiences Jesus and then she experiences the he he basically says to her as she's sitting there on his lap and just feeling like he's just like this dad and a friend and he says I'm much more than you realize mm. and then she sees right. this light coming up over the mountains where where she and Jesus are and she said it just filled the whole sky and it was it it wasn't a hand but it made like a hand that came and touched jesus and these lights merged and suddenly she realized all these words like omniscience and omnipotence and sovereignty and power and glory and all these words are trying to describe something but she said all you can say is whoa <laughs> There are no words. Those words are describing something, but it's something beyond description. And this is somebody who had no real preconception or whatever conception of God at that point. I mean, no, this she was a didn't. revelation. No, she's 12 that years went from, old. From a blank slate. Yeah. I, Suzanne, did you ever interview her? Yes. Okay. Suzanne yes. Seymour. Yeah. We've had her on so, the show. you know, yeah. I mean, is it, yeah, kind of a wild, wild story, but she didn't really know. But, and yet, she experiences Jesus taking her then to heaven where she experiences the triune nature of God. Didn't even know, but comes back uh, describing that. And then Heidi, a um, good friend of mine now, who was raised in a Jewish home, but atheist agnostic. Mm -hmm. Her dad had a mantra every day. Your life is worthless. There is no God. Jesus is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. Mm. It was an abusive home. Mm. Um, and Heidi, from the time of being a little girl, believed in God despite her father mm -hmm. and, and mother too, and prayed to God every night and felt his comfort, felt him kind of soothing her to sleep at night. So she's 16 when her horse rears back and crushes her and she's up 30 feet looking at her body, knows she's dead, light comes over her shoulder, and she said, there's Jesus. And she said, I wasn't, I wasn't shocked, like, what's a nice Jewish girl like me she, doing with Jesus? I'm she, not supposed to be with Jesus. She, she was expecting some other she wasn't uh, expecting, God, that, but certainly not the God of Jesus. Yeah, but what she said is, I knew him. This was the mm -hmm. God, this mm -hmm. was the man, but God, mm -hmm. who I'd been praying to my whole life. And then in the life review she had, Jesus showed her he was the one sitting by her bed. She was feeling comforting her as a little girl when she would pray. Mm. And then Jesus, of course, he takes her to the Father as well. And she experiences the majesty of the, of the Father. And then both she and Suzanne talk about, though Jesus left and put them back in their bodies, they also knew his presence would be with him, would go with him. Mm -hmm. 
And so now they understand the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but they had no clue. And, and so what I'm trying to show in Imagine the God of Heaven, there, there's 70 people's near-death experiences in there. But I'm trying to show that this is what the Bible's been showing us all along. This God that they are describing, and it's overlapping, that they shouldn't have known, mm -hmm. right? Right. Uh, I mean, we're talking about people from all over the world who had no biblical background necessarily. Yeah. And yet they're describing uh, this God that, like I said, stretches the box we put him in. Whether the, the majesty, the mystery of God, you know, they're mysteries. Deuteronomy 29, 29, you know, Moses says um, the secret things or the mysteries yes. of, of, of God belong to him, but the things revealed belong to us and our children and that we might follow them. We're accountable for those. We're not accountable for all the mysteries, but there are, you know, so there mm -hmm. are things that I think sometimes, especially Christians, we can put God in a box and say, well, I know the Bible and the Bible reveals the Lord and therefore there's nothing outside of my box that could be true about God. Right. And that's just not biblical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not. No. So we need to expand our box that way. But then there's another way we need to expand our box, which you were you know, thinking, talking about is God is way more personable, relatable, even fun. Mm -hmm. humorous, joyful yes. than we've ever imagined. And I think hearing you guys say that over and over and over again, and then seeing, wait, this is what God revealed through the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to tie in throughout, throughout the book, the mystery and majesty of God, but also the relatability of God, the compassion, the joy of God. Um, so that for all of us, it, it expands the box that we've, inevitably put him in and I, and I like in the in your new book that you're bringing out more of the personal aspects of what it is in meeting God yeah and being with him so there's a relational aspect because we have such a conflict today and have for ages now over you know that coin term uh, it's not about religion it's about relationship right and, yeah and another thing you do is you have validated those of us who have had these experience because you were an agnostic and you didn't really believe in NDEs, but you've been researching this for over now over 30 years. Oh yeah. And you're scientifically minded. You come from an engineering background before you started this yeah. mega church. And you were, I call it a mega church. I didn't start a mega a church. connotation, I know. I know. It organically. It was, it that was, was not an objective of, a, of yours. <laughs> that's, so, a, that's like a curse sudden, people, word now. Don't, don't tune out. You, know, <laughs> you just not, cussed at it me. It was not an objective. You know, it just no, turned out that way. It is way. funny, though, because people say, oh, you're a mega church pastor. I'm like, you don't. We started with five of us in a home <laughs> and all we started doing is offering this like, do you know who God is? Mm -hmm. Do you know how much he cares yeah. about you? And then one by one, you know, there, people need the hope that yeah. God offers and Especially people need today and people need to know. And, and that's what I'm trying to point out. You know, in Imagine the God of Heaven, one of the reasons it was the only thing I wanted to write about after Imagine Heaven. Like I was like, Lord, what else is there? And what he reminded me of is interviewing so many of you guys over, like you said, three decades. The most consistent thing is I would, I would be pressing for, well, what did Jesus look like? Well, tell me about the landscape of heaven, the beauty of heaven. And yeah, there are, you know, the, the, and you guys would say things like there are mountains and there are valleys and trees and beauty and flowers and colors like you've never imagined. And, and yeah, the reunions, we're still ourselves. The hugs go deeper. It's like real life. But consistently, I would hear into ears say, but nothing, I mean, nothing compares to being in the presence of God. Yes. And you, you it said that to, to me, that. Yeah. like, you know, I, I, it was, yeah, it was gorgeous, but I wasn't looking at that. Yeah. I couldn't help looking into his eyes. Right. Yes. Yes. All of that was on the peripheral. That was almost and, secondary. And that was what, secondary. And that's what I realized. You know, we, we just don't have. Um, we don't have a good enough conception of God. Mm -hmm. 
Even Amen. those of us who know the Bible really well. Yes. We don't. Because if we did, if we did, we would hold nothing back. Oh. Nothing. And that's another facet that you bring out in yeah. your book. And that is that every life was changed dramatically. Oh. Not just in a, in a small way. I mean, these are people that were giving up things, their, their life, their previous life. Yeah. And oftentimes their career. And, and, but they were internally, they were transformed in their entire nature, weren't they? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, like you think about, we were just recently together um, with, with a group of people um, who, had, who have had near-death experiences. And you're talking about, you know, a spine surgeon, um, commercial airline pilots, you were a CEO, people forget that. <laughs> you know, you were a top medical executive and CEO, and when you first came to me, you were like, if I talk about this, it's gonna, it's gonna ruin my business, it's gonna ruin my career, but I'm compelled to. I remember mm -hmm. you saying that, you know? Yeah. And people forget, they don't, they don't think about that. They think, oh, well, Randy Kay, he's that guy who has the, the YouTube channel. But all these people I've talked to, almost all of them, you know, they're professors, they're, they have a lot to lose. They're not doing this to write a book or go on a speaking tour. <laughs> That's like, why? It's not, it's not that easy. Yeah. Well, we went out to dinner with your uh, lovely wife and last night and what I, I started regurgitating about, you know, business stuff and what I was doing in the hospital and surgery and all that. And I thought, I realized I was talking to my wife. We were together, the four of us. And I said, oh my goodness, I just realized how much I, I haven't been able to talk about those things, you yeah. know? Yeah. It's no longer, that's, that's, a, that's another life in the past. And well, a lot and of these because people you're talking does. about, that, that's what happened. And, it, and, and that's consistent, is it is so compelling that that it is it is and this is what happened to me i was an engineer and i started not only studying these near-death experiences i started it opened me up to start looking into the scriptures and asking my questions and and getting answers and then i came to faith in christ and the more i grew and the more i realized oh my gosh there's so much evidence <laughs> how can people not see this yes and I felt compelled to talk about it. You know, the first talk I gave on near-death experiences and the Bible and how they overlap was in 1989 at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Oh my goodness. So I've been doing yeah. this for a long yeah. time. I just hadn't, I hadn't written on it because, um, and, and I talk about that a little bit in Imagine the God of Heaven, is near-death experiences initially um, I, I think, unfortunately, pastors who had not embraced Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine that there are mysteries I don't know, and I and I need to. I think it's really important to both keep an open mind to be able to listen and hear, but always weigh everything according mm -hmm. to the scriptures. Like if it goes against what God's revealed in scripture, yes. then you go wait, right? You know, and I like to say I don't believe every NDE. That's that's not the Neither posture. Do I. Yeah. Yes. And, and I'll tell you, I mean, because what I've realized over the years is you guys are describing truly something otherworldly. You know, I like to say it would be like, imagine that, that we're living on this flat wall right here and it's black and white and death means separation. So when we die, our soul separates from our body, as you well know. So imagine you're on this black and white flat wall and then your soul peels off that two-dimensional wall into a three-dimensional reality you had mm -hmm. no conception of was around you because you didn't have a, you had up and down and side to side, you didn't even have in or out. You didn't have a third dimension, mm -hmm. right. no concept. So now you're out here and you're still experiencing the, the world you were in because it's contained within this larger dimensionality you're experiencing three dimensions in color, and then you get pressed back into the flat two-dimensional black and white world, and you have to describe three dimensions of color, but in two-dimensional black and white terms. And, and, and you're in your spirit body, so your multidimensional senses enhance and all of those things. So not only is the environment t completely different in terms of, the, of the, what it, how it presents, 
but also the way to assimilate right. that understanding of it. Yeah, is you, and you're you're having. I mean, you guys have described it to me as. I didn't have five senses. It was like 50 senses. Yes. Sometimes they're, they described as blended senses. Mm -hmm. You saw things that had smell and you <laughs> heard things that had, you know, sight, visual, visual things. And I mean, it doesn't make sense to us, no. but again, it's because we couldn't describe color in a black in black and white terms. Mm -hmm. It's just, you're grappling for words. And you see that with the prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Ezekiel sounds weird, right? He does. The revelation. Yeah. And, yeah. and so my, my point is that all of you are having to grapple for words and interpret. Mm. And so there are gonna be things that, you, you know, if, if, if someone grew up in India, they may have the same experience, but they may interpret it differently. And I actually, I actually have an example like that in the book. Yes. So for instance, um, I've got probably, I don't know, five or six, I don't remember how many Indians. Grew up Hindu. Um, Santosh is one of Santosh. them who I just love Santosh. Yes, we've you've, had you've, him on this show. Yes. You've had Santosh on. And you know, here, here's an in, in, Indian manufacturing engineer, only knew Hinduism, and yet this brilliant God of light who he falls in love with, personal, caring for him, takes him, to this place and he perfectly describes the holy city of God just like John does in Revelation 21. Except he he describes it as this giant compound. And I, I've been to mm -hmm. India, we built a hospital in India. There are compounds everywhere. There are these high walled compounds. So that's what was yes. in his mind. So that's what he describes. He says high walls, beautiful, gorgeous, but thousands of miles, because you can see, he mm -hmm. said telescopically, and he counted 12 gates all closed to him and then he sees that in God itself on his is an amazing 12 gates right yeah he had no conception of numbers of with the, angels and gates. he says then i realized that i'm looking at the kingdom of heaven and he longed to go in right and then he sees a vision of hell and he describes it as an abyss lake of fire it's like where'd you get that and then he sees who he now thinks maybe was the glorified jesus on his throne and next to jesus he he find First of all, you know, he gets a life review. He starts to say, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive, because he sees the good and the bad. He sees the, his sins. Mm -hmm. And then he feels the tender, compassionate mercy of God when he speaks to him. And he says, I'm going to send you back. And he sees this narrow, he called it a narrow gate open to me. I could go in through the narrow gate. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> And, you know, as you know, it's only when he goes back that he described, he, he walks into a church one day as he's seeking God. And, um, and the pastor is speaking on Jesus saying, you know, enter through the narrow gate into the kingdom of heaven. And I am the gate through which people will enter in. And he goes back and reads the Bible. And he's like, that's everything I experienced. But you have multiple people like that. So and his father was a high priest. Oh, yeah. He was a Sanskrit that, scholar. Yes. That, that, that's amazing in itself. I mean, he was truly indoctrinated, indoctrinated into, into that religion. Right. So here's, he's a manufacturing engineer, Hindu by background, and nothing to gain talking about that God. Right. Then you've got uh, another, another man I talk about in Imagine the God of Heaven, Dr. Rajiv Parthi, mm -hmm. chief anesthesiologist at the Bakersfield Heart Hospital. Yes. <laughs> and so again, nothing to gain talking about this. And yet in his near death experience, which, which he did, he was an anesthesiologist. So he had heard multiple times, guys like you come to talking about this tunnel and beauty and this God of light. And he'd give him a shot of Halidol of antipsychotic. You know? <laughs> He's like, and he'd say, I'd go check the stock report and just blow it off because it didn't happen. It was just hallucination. That's what he thought then he has a near-death experience and he got the same treatment by his anesthesiologist he said hold the the, the uh, they didn't believe him and a psychotic yeah but what was crazy is he experienced similar thing um first he starts in a hellish place he cries out what he said for repentance to god and he said two christian angels bring him through a tunnel to this gorgeous place this gorgeous landscape 
and to this God of light, brighter than the sun, thousands of times brighter, but easy to look at all the things you guys have said. And, um, and in his presence, you know, he, he not only feels love, but he also gets a life review and the Lord shows him the things, you know, he had, he had gotten into and done. He said, these are going to have to change. I'm going to send you back. And he said, and why he would say this, I thought this might be Jesus. I thought this might be Jesus. Well, then later he has an encounter with this same God of light as he's, as he's leading his friend who's dying, Naresh, um, I, I think to understand what he had experienced and the, the mercy of God and the, the goodness of God. And at the night Naresh dies, he has a shared death vision of Naresh with this God of light. And, and he's there with him. And he asked this God of light and love, who are you, Lord? Because he's, he came back and he's like, this is not the God that I was expecting. This is not the Hindu gods. And his wife said, where were the Hindu gods? Why Christian angels? He said, I don't know. But he started seeking. And again, he asked, who are you, Lord? And he said, out of this brilliant light steps a man in a long robe and a gold sash with a trim beard and says, I'm Jesus, your savior. Mm. And he falls to his knees. Amazing. And this is happening all over the world. Um, now, the point I was going to make is I, I, um, I report a couple of other people from a Hindu background, for instance. Uh, Nia was actually in Africa when a lioness bit her head and she had a near death experience, leaves her body, you know, sees all that. And then she describes this. She says glow light, like the sunrise, like the sun that, that led me. And she says, God definitely exists. And she said, led me to this beautiful place. Some might call heaven or God. And then she comes back. Now, what she says is, I experienced the goddess Durga. Mm. Um, that's, she said that that was the goddess Durga, which is the, the, the god of the, the mother of creation kind of goddess in her, you know, in her background. Um, now, the goddess Durga is actually described as a, a woman with eight to ten arms holding weapons in every hand, riding a lion. Yeah, I've seen images. It's not attractive. Well, that's not who she described. And what I'm showing in Imagine the God of Heaven is she described the same God of light and love that appeared to Moses 3,500 years ago on Mount Sinai as a light in a bush. He calls a fire that didn't burn the bush. Mm. Or this, this light on the mountain that appears to, to uh, Israel, right? Mm-hmm. And they said this is all consuming fire, but it didn't consume, right? And, and this is the same God that appears to Paul when he is persecuting Christians. So he didn't believe in Jesus. Right. Yes, because some Christians would say, well, why would all these people who don't believe in Jesus see the same God? Well, Paul did. Mm -hmm. This God of light, you know, Acts chapter 9 appears to him. Who are you, Lord? Just like Rajiv said, mm -hmm. I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. Now, a very important thing to realize is that Jesus did not tell Paul what to do, and he didn't explain the gospel. Mm. That confuses a lot of Christians. Like, well, what if this is why do they feel love from God? And why didn't he tell them who who he is and what they're supposed to do? As if he couldn't if he wanted to, <laughs> you know, like, oh, well, I had to wait for them to die. No, he can do whatever he wants. That's not his method. And he sends Ananias to tell Paul. And Paul still had a free will. Mm. Will he, you know, because he had a lot to lose leaving Phariseeism. He was a, he was a big yeah. deal in, in Jerusalem. Will he leave that to follow Jesus? He still had a choice to make. And that's what I find is that God doesn't take away the free will of people having NDEs. And what they experience, whether hell or heaven, is not necessarily what their eternity is going to be. They're just getting a glimpse. Mm-hmm. So Nia, for instance, comes back. She interprets this as 
the goddess Durga, but that's not actually who she's describing. She's saying, describing the same God of light and love who is personal. And then she says, I also came back with an understanding of Christianity and Jesus, which I had not had at all before. So she had no preconception no. whatsoever. Why Jesus? Why That's not amazing. Buddha? Why not, you know, I mean, yeah. there are lots of other. There are lot, lots of Hindu gods from which to choose. But this is happening all over the world. Swadik is another one um, that I have uh, that I write about and imagine the God of heaven. He was an imam in Rwanda. Mm. So he's in Rwanda. His mother and father were split between Hutu and Tutsi in that whole genocide. Their family got torn apart. Um, just a, a wild story. He became a drug dealer because he was living on the streets from eight. Mm. Um, and then reconciles with his father who was an imam. So he wants to please his father. So he, be he becomes an imam, was a leader in the, in the mosque in mm -hmm. is, is Islam. He was like a, a Islamic apologist arguing against Christians. Mm. And, um, and then he ends up dying of, of blood cancer. And his mom had, uh, she had felt hopeless and helpless. She'd prayed to her goddess Beku. They had, they had brought the, the Muslims in to do everything they could, couldn't do anything. The hospital had given up and was just put on palliative care. And she went to her friend who was a Christian and their whole church was praying and she was praying to Jesus. Oh. Swadik dies and he's starting in a hellish experience as well when into this room where the these demonic creatures are attacking him comes this man brighter than the sun but a white robe and a gold sash and a trim beard with his hands held out and holes in his wrists this is swadik and a mom in rwanda <laughs> he could not have known about well so he had he had gotten free movie tickets and had seen the passion of the christ mel gibson's movie mm -hmm. um, and he said that's how i knew who this was because i recognized from that movie <laughs> <laughs> and jesus says to him i died for mankind you are among those i died for do not deny it and tell everyone mm. swadik wakes up at his at his burial so he, he sits up and he's looking around and there are all these people running and screaming and he looks to the right and there's a big hole in the ground and he said, someone must have died. <laughs> <laughs> and then again, he sees Jesus there looking at him and he remembers, oh, do not deny it and tell everyone. And he starts proclaiming, Jesus is here among us. He's, he brought me back. He brought me back from the dead. Jesus is here. And they're just going crazy. But half of them came to faith in Jesus that day. Now, Swadik to this day is now an Anglican priest who has had seven attempts on his life because you, you can't do that. You can't convert from Islam. Right. And then go around telling everybody, Jesus saved can't me. Can't processize. Yeah. yeah. And, and so there's, these people have nothing to gain, a lot to lose. But what I'm trying to show is that they may not be interpreting God the same, but they're describing the same God. Mm. And this God has been revealing himself and his attributes through scripture all along. Mm. And so in Imagine the God of Heaven, I'm trying to show the, what those characteristics, those attributes are, what God's heart has always been, how personal he is to each one of us, illustrated through 70 of you who have clinically died and come back and been in his presence. Yes. Well, you know that I think that's the pr perspective that we need to understand from other religions and people f of other religions and faiths, those who have had no faith and, and see that there is continuity now in those who seek out, either seek out the truth, have an experience with a near death experience that it kind of that leads to that truth. Yeah. You know, John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you, set free. you free. And that freedom. I'm gonna, just as a, as a final question to you, John, I'm gonna touch on a sensitive topic that uh, maybe, maybe I should have led with this one, but it has <laughs> to do with, 
with uh, the fact that uh, in this space, in the near-death experiences and after afterlife, that there's there's an adoption of these experiences in other venues outside of Christianity. Oh yeah, that speak of more the Hindu type or they have their own interpretation, of different religions, right. New Age and what have right. you. But our our family, the family of of uh, Christ as Christians, so Judeo Christians, mm -hmm. uh, we don't find that same acceptance within the church as a whole, and that saddens me. That you saddens mean the me. church accepting the reality of near-death near -death experiences? Near-death experiences, and it's not talked about. Oftentimes, well, I, it has a history. That has a history, and and it goes all the way back, and it's why it took me so long to write. And when I wrote Imagine Heaven eight years ago, right before I pushed send, I said, okay, Lord, I did what you wanted. This might be the end of my ministry, but so be it. You asked me to do this, send, mm -hmm. you know? And I told you, he said, I, I heard in my head, I've opened a door in heaven no one can close. Mm. Which when I look at, like, like you said, Imagine Heaven, it just keeps growing, growing, growing year by year. Well, books, that doesn't happen. No. Books launch and then they, yeah, you know, I don't um, know of any other book really outside of the Bible and it. Well, and it others. doesn't make sense. It doesn't, except he said that, and I think so many people have told me that they've been led to faith or have led helped others find faith. And I think what the church, back to your question, in the early days of this, which is when I first encountered it. What happened many times is many pastors didn't know and didn't take the time to ask the questions. And so they would hear these experiences. And there were a lot of things that I didn't realize reconciled with the Bible. I'll give you a couple examples. Like um, when a near-death experiencer says, you know, well, I was, I was out of my body, but I was up above my body and I was watching my body. Well, that's like spooky, like ghosts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're ghosts right right yeah so that was the first thought i had and you know so you so you're like well where's that in the bible or you know now i i i think i think the reality is paul who i believe did possibly have a near-death experience acts uh, chapter 14 in lystra he's stoned to death mm -hmm. and dragged out of the city and left for dead you know, I mean, they knew how to kill people with stones back then. I don't, I don't know if they didn't have medical intervention like they do today. Well, so. and how do you get back up and go back into the city unless it's miraculous revival, right? Right. right. And that's what Paul did. Well, then in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. He's talking about himself. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. taken up to the third heaven. I was taken to paradise and heard and saw things inexpressible, things people aren't allowed to tell. Yeah. So I think when he's describing the spiritual body in 1 Corinthians 15, he had knowledge of it, right? So, but when people initially were talking about this and then maybe they would describe these colors beyond our color spectrum and um, eyesight that was telescopic and, you know, um, Te telepathy so you know they that's how they would describe it like mm -hmm. thought to thought communication right and i think pastors would be like well that's not biblical there's something wrong and they would immediately go that's satanic leave it alone stay away from it mm -hmm. and people who had had near-death experiences are they're coming for understanding mm -hmm. they're seeking god and yet they got kind of pushed away mm -hmm. now what what i discovered in time of grappling with and hearing more and more and then really wrestling with the scriptures things like for instance telescopic eyesight well john in revelation 21 is taken to a great high mountain overlooking the holy city of god just like santosh and he is able to read the names on the foundation stones mm -hmm. how <laughs> same dynamic same. he just didn't say i had telescopic vision but he did yes. somehow Right. Just like Santosh describes, um, colors beyond our color spectrum. So I've got blind people, people blind from birth and imagine the God of heaven and imagine heaven. 
and they can see in their near-death experience. Now, one of the things that they talk about is in heaven, the light comes out of everything. It's kind of like everything is, in, is, is alive with this light. You described it, this light flowing off of Jesus like a river, and as it washed across the flowers, they bloom again and again, mm -hmm. right? Let's not go there yet. Okay. I mean, I, no, I okay. know how that but, impacts but me. But Jim yes, Woodford said the yes, same thing. Yes, Heidi said yes. the same thing. I mean, on and on. Now, right. you, you, again, Christians maybe hear this initially and go, oh, you know, that's weird. That's, that's other, you know, that's not biblical. But again, you know, in Isaiah 60, in Revelation 21, it says that there is no sun or moon in heaven. The glory of God is its light. And then in Revelation 21, and the nations will walk in that light. All right, now think about this. If the light then coming out of everything is not just light, like we think of it, it's life and love, you guys say. It's all mm -hmm. one. And that is giving life and energy to everything in heaven. Yeah. As Dean Braxton said, you know, what you'll describe, realize in heaven is, you know, on earth we know entropy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, thermodynamic term, but everything's going to chaos. It, everything is slowly unwinding. But in heaven, the light and life of God, everything is growing, continually getting better. And, and, and so you hear these things and you think, okay, well then that makes total sense that the colors of heaven are gonna be way beyond our color spectrum because the color spectrum of earth is just the breakdown of the light of the sun, mm -hmm. but the color spectrum of heaven is the breakdown of the glory of God. Right. That might... So you start to piece it all together and it's, it's there. Yeah. But people initially rejected. And what happened is when Christians rejected these and, and didn't take the time you know, and that's what I'm trying to do and imagine heaven and imagine the God of heaven. I'm trying to show this is what the scriptures have said all along and what these people overlappingly commonly say. They're describing what God's been revealing. And when we didn't take time to do that, a lot of these people felt rejected. And then they went to others who said, oh, well, come over here. We'll embrace mm -hmm. you. But they had a, a, a different worldview. And so they started to interpret it. For instance, you know, um, heaven and hell though they are describing what the bible describes some will say well those are just different vibrational energy states and so you just have to work on your vibrational energy state and that's wherever your vibrational energy state is where you're going to go but don't worry about it because you can you can change places there <laughs> and that's also why i say don't believe what any one near-death experiencer says You've, you've got to test everything according to, well, what has God revealed? And, and here's another reason why. Because a commonality I write about is a border or a boundary. People knew they couldn't cross over and still come back. Mm -hmm. In some cases like yours, Jesus just said, you got to go back. But in others, they, they were going forward and then they realized if, if I cross over here, I can't go back to earth. And in some cases, Jesus, I report Jesus telling them, you haven't died yet. You have to go back. Yet they didn't have brain waves. So from our view of clinical death, they had died. So I think these near-death experiences are some liminal state between what we would call eternity, that full crossing over, and what we would call clinical death. And we don't know exactly what that is. But I liken it to, you know, if I, if I went and visited Buckingham Palace, you know, I could, I could see wonders there, but that doesn't mean the king and queen of England have decided to adopt me into their family and let me move in permanently. I like that. I'm just visiting. I like that analogy. Yeah. And that's what I think near-death experiences are. They mm -hmm. are God's testimonies that heaven is real, hell is real, but more importantly, God is real, and he cares about each individual and knows us more better than we know ourselves, mm. loves us more than any relationship on earth ever could be likened to and did everything possible, including invading humanity and laying his life down so that he could be just because we want justice too. And I write about, I write about the hidden justice of God, right. yes. that he could be just in forgiving us yes. by paying, paying it for us through Christ. Yeah. 
it's a it's a dynamic that one can intellectually process but one must experience yeah fully and so i think i think the the christians in the church are um i think they are starting to realize you know this is a gift from god just like any gift so i'll, I'll use an example sex is a gift from god he thought it up mm -hmm. now if you just look at the way people use it mm -hmm. you could say oh that's that's against god mm -hmm. well no people use god's good gifts in ways that harm us and others but it's still a good gift from god and as Christians, we need to speak into what did God intend, not run away from it. Yes. Just because it gets abused. Same with these near-death experiences. So we shouldn't run away from them. And when there's confusion, we should grapple with it. Mm -hmm. And mystery, we should, we should hold some space for mysteries that we can't completely explain. But at the same time, we have to keep going back to the scriptures and, and saying, Okay, there's only one who's come from eternity, and that's Jesus. All these near-death experiences were in that liminal state between clinical death and eternity, mm -hmm. but they hadn't crossed over the boundary. So they can't tell us everything. Mm -hmm. What they can tell us is what Jesus has revealed, what God revealed through the prophets for thousands of years, and what he's revealed through Jesus is, is true. Yes. And they're giving testimony to that all over the globe. And that is something I think that that must be heeded, you know, overall, to come to a determination not based on the one single verse necessarily, but the context of all of the verses within the Bible. Yeah. And looking at this from the perspective of also medical interventions which allow people to come back from clinical death. Many more than we've ever seen. And so yeah. we're seeing this dynamic, and that's another reason why uh, we are hearing of these stories in greater numbers, and I think there's an, also another, another uh, godly purpose, and that is because these are, to your point earlier, bringing people to a closer understanding of uh, Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, I'll tell you, writing Imagine the God of Heaven, it just, it just deepened my love for God so much. I mean... Mm. Yes, I, I go I there say, too. Now you're going to get emotional. I like know. I well, do. it's he's amazing. Yes, and and way beyond. Like I said, you know, and that's why, quite honestly, Randy, leaving 25 years of investing in in this church, and quite honestly, you know, people, it's it's comfortable. It could be comfortable. It's not easy, but I'm starting over again. Yes. And it's like, why? And then sometimes I've been like, really, Lord? <laughs> you know, like, I'm 60. I'm not really ready to just yeah. start over again. But then the other part of it is that this just reminds you of how good God is, how we can trust him, how he has a plan and he's working that plan. And it really is moment by moment, but we have to trust him. And I think what, you know, what these stories together with the scriptures show is that we can trust him with everything mm. and there's no one we should trust more not yes. even ourselves absolutely absolutely and that's what i'm praying that as people read imagine the god of heaven that they will just fall deeply in love with the lord uh -huh. like he's deeply in love with them and they'll let him guide them moment by moment through life and i and i trust that they will because it's a great book and people can find uh imagine the god of heaven in all of the major book outlets, is there another place they might go to to? to yeah, I mean, book? I'm I'm excited because uh, hopefully this message is going to it's you know it's the message of Jesus right of what right. he's done. It's going to be in Costco and Hobby Lobby and bookstores everywhere uh, and yeah. So in time for uh, Christmas, a good Christmas gift. Yeah. Now, John, I have all the pleasure uh, on all of our shows to offer to our guests to pray for our audience. Yeah, uh, I would love to. So now I have that privilege of asking you to yeah. look into the camera and pray for our audience. Please. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, um, maybe, maybe some watching who stumbled across this video, uh, maybe you don't have a relationship with God or you're not sure 
uh, he says he wants you to be confident of his love, his unconditional love and forgiveness. And God, thank you that you've made it so simple because of what Jesus did. All you have to tell him, and you can tell him right now, is God, I, I want you in my life. I yes. want your forgiveness and leadership that Jesus purchased for me on the cross. And thank you, God, that you have made it so simple because you created us to be your children. And, and we, what, what would we not do to have our children who have wandered from us come back home? And yet you're a better parent than we ever could think of. Mm, yes. And God, I pray for every person watching that their hearts would just be stirred and moved to seek you out more. Uh, not to read my book or Randy's book or any of our books, but to start with your book, the Bible, and to want to know what you've revealed about yourself fully and how you came to earth to show us how relatable you are. You revealed the unseen, infinite, uh, omnipotent God in a form we could relate to, mm -hmm. and then even laid down your life to die for us. Lord, you're so good, and you love us so much, and I pray every person listening would just have that clear sense of, I wanna, I wanna follow you better, I wanna trust you more, because you're, you are trustworthy, and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, John. This has been a, indeed a pleasure. Yeah, so and great to be with you again. Great to be with you again. And now to our audience. Uh, I don't like it. Emotional. Um, some of you make a, a decision, and uh, it's the most important one of your life. Let us know. Go to our website at randyk.org. If you have, we want to. We want to stay in communication, send you some things, um, but, but the, today is, is a new life for you. Hmm. It's not a, a life that is going to be free of trials. Jesus said that uh, we would have trials in this life as, as he experienced them when he walked on this earth. But here's the great news, and that is, if you are in Christ Jesus, then be of good cheer. Because heaven in your future. Take care. God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.